Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2004 commencement program. I'm Dave Webb, the principal here at Fridley High School, and I'm truly proud of the students that are gathered here tonight that are, will be graduating and soon crossing the stage in just a few minutes. Before I introduce our first student speaker this evening, I'd like to introduce the folks we have seated behind me on the stage. From your left to right, we have our school board members, Fred Bischke, Sandra Rudolph, Greg Rosholt, Gordon Backlund, Larry Johnson, and Kim Sampson. Next, we have our new superintendent in Fridley, Mark Robertson, our faculty speaker for this evening, Kirk Myra, and our associate principal, Renee Van Gorp. Our welcome this evening will be provided by one of our student council vice presidents and also one of the nicest kids, I think, in our entire school, Joe Royth. Please welcome Joe to the floor tonight. Good evening, uh, Dr. Webb, Ms. Van Gorp. Ms. Van Gorp, Mr. Robertson, uh, distinguished school board members, um, community members, family, friends. Um, welcome to the commencement of the graduating class of 2004. On behalf of my fellow students, I would like to be the first to thank you for joining us all on this special day. Without the support and sacrifices of loving families and countless teachers, we would not be sitting here today. This class has excelled in academics, athletics, and in the arts. To commence means to begin. And with that, let us begin. Thank you. Would the choir and band members make their way back to their respective groups at this time?
choir and band members make their way back to their seats, I'd like to thank both Mr. Messer and Mr. Berger for all of their outstanding music leadership at our high school. Our next student speaker this evening is Brianne Quatera. Brianne, you can make your way to the stage at this time. As she is, uh, as she is approaching the, the uh, podium here, I'd like to share just uh, my thoughts on Brianne. She is one hardworking, uh, strong academic, strong athletic student in our school. She's also uh, always willing to stand up to do the right thing, and I really am proud of that. I want to welcome Brianne Quatera. Class of 2004, did you ever think we'd be here, sitting in these alphabetical rows with our caps and gowns on just like everyone before us? Today is the day that we close a 13-year-old book filled with chapters of laughter, tears, studying, proms, pep fests, school lunches, popping milk cartons, driver's license, and so much more. Thankfully or unfortunately, whichever you choose, a lot of those things will be making an appearance to the sequel of our lives. We played our last games, developed senioritis, painted our section of the wall, we've eaten our senior brunch, watched the slideshow, danced our hearts out at our last prom, acquired our final gra grades, and counted down our last minutes. Commencement seems like the last thing left, but receiving our diploma tonight will only be the beginning. Graduation to most of us means independence. It means experiencing life alone. Although we leave this school tonight as graduates of Fridley High School, we will forever be students. The classroom is everywhere you look, the teacher is yourself, of course, and the curriculum is life. Get used to being uncomfortable for a while, because our comfort zone is erased after we walk on this stage and receive that small piece of paper with our name on it. It means so much more than it sounds. Congratulate yourself. We finally accomplished something that not everybody does. We are all dealt different hands in life, and whether our experiences be good or bad, we can all learn something from them. I haven't had the easiest hand to play, but with each day that passes, I take in more and more advice on life. Today, I want to share with you some ideas that can assist us with our lives after high school. As we begin our journey through life after high school, we take with us our memories, values, theories, fears, goals, and aspirations that we have established in hopes of finding new ones and achieving the old ones. The life experiences we are about to take hold of are going to shape our characteristics even more than they have been and develop an identity for ourselves. Your life is what you make it, and it can be wonderful if you let it. We have no business questioning life. Instead, live life and live it well. Realize that life is glorious and that we have no business taking it for granted. Live each day as if it were your last. I'm not talking about existing because that would be too easy. Notice the color of your mother's eyes, the whispers trees make. Appreciate the smile a stranger gave it you and pass it on. Notice the walk of your father and tell a friend you appreciate them as a person. Live. As unfair as this may sound, life isn't meant to be fair. It never was and never will be. Recognize this as soon as you can, because if you don't, all you'll do is pity yourself. Everyone has problems, everyone has frustrations, and they are all every bit as real as our own. If something is bad today, ask yourself if it will matter tomorrow. We will face many struggles and battles in life, so choose every battle wisely. Life is filled to choose between making a big deal out of something or simply letting it go. If you choose wisely, you'll win those that are truly important. Then maybe someday you won't have to battle at all. I read in a book that unhappiness is the struggle against the natural flow of experience. So admit life is hard and be happy. If you realize this and try to be happy and believe in happiness, you will find it. Smile. You'll be surprised what a smile can change. If you look at problems and obstacles as an inevitable part of life, you'll find yourself not worrying as much. Worrying is just wasted energy. Every problem and every joy in life has a beginning and an end. Wait it, wait it out if it's bad, it will end. And enjoy it while it's good, because those moments too will end. Mr. Lou once said that there will never be enough minutes in life to understand life. 
Stop analyzing, lighten up, and go with the flow. Don't get frustrated because something unexpected happens. That's life in itself. Instead of trying to figure out a life you will never come to conclusion to, spend the time finding peace with yourself. Peace to face the unpleasantries. Remember that you can't change the past and that you certainly cannot predict the future. Try not to let past problems and future concerns dominate your present life. Be patient with life. Next time you find yourself waiting in line, stuck in traffic, or running a couple of minutes late, try to look at the big picture. It's so easy to be impatient, but finding patience offers a dimension of ease and acceptance that will assist us in life forever. Don't demand a lot, a lot out of life, because life doesn't require us a lot to be here. Throughout life, we will meet hundreds of thousands of new people. Treat others the way we want to be treated. Like people. Like them enough to get to know them. Develop compassion in the following years. Sometimes the only thing someone needs to get through his or her day is an ear to confide in. Be that ear. Open your heart to them. Instead of waiting your chance to respond, listen to that person's entire thought. You will truly learn a lot from listening instead of hearing them. Remember not everyone is going to like us and that we can't please everyone. The less you care about seeking approval, the more approval you'll receive from yourself. Reward yourself with people you come in contact with daily. Find people you love and who love you. Each and every person has a different outlook on life. We see life as we want to see it. If we search for ugliness and conflict, we'll find plenty of it. If we look for fault in people, we'll find it. But if you look at life as a gift, you'll never be disappointed. Take a look at the view instead of pretending you know what it looks like. Some people are so busy with life they fail to notice the little things. Don't be one of those persons. Life is not an emergency and today is barely a guarantee. Slow down and learn to relax. Be bored, I heard it clears your mind. By slowing down your mind, you'll begin to notice more people and more views that you've missed. Make goals for yourself. Stop expecting so much from everyone. When you expect a lot from others, all you are doing is setting yourself up for disappointment. You will truly be touched by the unexpected. Think of what you have instead of what you want. It could be far worse. Whenever we are attached to having something a certain way, we are engaged in a losing battle. Remember that more is not always better. You can sp spend forever wanting more or just decide to want less. In order for each of us to become who we truly want to become, the first step is to silence our biggest critic, ourselves. Don't argue your limitations or it's guaranteed you'll start believing in them. We all have the potential to be who we want to be. Don't be intimidated by the real world and find comfort with you. We have a whole new life to embark on and get ready for. We can decide to be sad that this is the end of the beginning or we can be thankful for the memories that we've made. Take with you next year, wherever you go, memories of school dances, snow week, homecoming, building trades, budging in front of lunch lines because we're big seniors, but still managing to get caught by Mr. Myra and Mr. Barrett every time. Remember almost losing one of our classmates to a basketball hoop and then later to the police. The highs and lows of our sports seasons, from the volleyball and football team taking just above last in conference to the boys basketball team winning the conference. Don't forget that this is the class that brought new meaning to the freshman swim chant. And remember escaping the dramas of high school and the small hole in the wall that we call Reichel's office. Don't forget, of course, the teachers and students that have impacted your life. You'll always have a place for them in your heart. There is so much to look forward to in the years to come. We've spent 13 years learning how to be successful. Now it's our job to do just that. Good luck, class of 2004. Get her done. Our next student speaker this evening is Livy Tracek. Some of you have seen her in some of our drama productions at our school. She's also a, a fine president of our student council. And please welcome Livy Tracek again. Well. Here we are at our commencement. Isn't it weird to say our commencement? Even though I have, like a lot of you, been in the setting before, 
I have cheered on family and friends as their names have been called and they filed on the stage and received their diplomas. So when I wrote this speech, it wasn't so difficult for me to imagine the setting, the balloons and the people behind us. But it was difficult for me to imagine what I would feel when I stood before you in my class for the very last time. So instead of trying to create the emotions, I began instead to remember what had happened to us as a class over the course of many years, which not surprisingly brought about many emotions. Of course, there were some major events that popped into my head right away, such as the holiday parties in grade school. I remember the kindergarten Halloween costume parade and the high schoolers coming to sing to us at Christmas time. I can recall the rainforest made in some of our third grade classes, and I remember when the girls and the boys got split up in fifth grade healthy living class for that talk about you know what. <laughs> of course, I remember the great watermelon fight at the sixth grade picnic. I can still see us sitting there at Commons Park, punished by sitting in neat rolls and forbidden to talk. We were red and sticky, yet we were proud of our rebellion. I remember going to cheapskate in seventh grade and learning to sew pillows in healthy living class. Chicago will forever remind me of our band trip in eighth grade, and I can still see us all digging for those ancient fossils when I think of our last year in middle school. I remember what it felt like to be at my last homecoming game, at my first homecoming game as a freshman, finally a part of that high school section. And it seems like only yesterday that we were sitting on that side for our first pep fest, and the cheer of the freshman swim was directed at us. And I remember where I was on September 11th when I heard about the hijacked planes. In the midst of all these memories, there lingers with me still today a sense of unity. It wasn't just my unique clown costume that I remember from the kindergarten parade, but the multitude of Princess Jasmines, pirates, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles silently filing down the hallways. And I definitely remember more than just myself throwing those watermelon chunks. Even though I don't remember the words, of the CNN news reporters who spoke on 9-11, I do remember the silence we shared and the patriotism that united not just our school, but the entire nation. Just as our parents, who I remember where they were when JFK was assassinated or when man first walked on the moon, we will always remember what class we were in and the friends who were there who comforted us when we heard about the tragedy. Our grandparents have a day that will live in infamy, and because of September 11th, so do we. However, for every one of these major events, both happy and sad, I can remember many more seemingly trivial memories. These are the types of memories that we never really think about until for some reason or another, they pop into our heads. They are memories such as roll call. Were you always, without fail, the very first name read? Or were you the dreaded last name, which was hardly ever audible over your classmates talking so loudly? Let me ask you if you even needed to be told who you were going to sit next to today. I doubt it, because the people you're sitting next to have probably been your locker buddies since middle school. These people have, over the course of many years, seen more emotions than your parents and learned to interpret them maybe better than even your best friends. One hit against the locker means annoyed, two kicks means a tough day, and the combination of the two means help right away. Some of us, of course, have needed more help than others. But stop for a moment and take a look at the people you're sitting next to. These people will no longer be there for you and need a quick laugh or a piece of gum. There are no more lockers in the real world. There will, however, continue to be public bathrooms. I doubt, though, that they will hold the same significance as the school bathrooms have held for some of us. A mental picture of wet hands from a lack of paper towels and gossip comes to my mind when I hear the words blue stalls. I can think of only one other place that held more gossip. Girls, do you remember the notebooks from middle school? Do you remember the fierce competition to share a notebook with as many people as possible and how eagerly we cut up our teen magazines just to create that perfect cover, which could, only be all, which could only be done if we all did our last one? And between collecting pogs, doing yo-yo tricks, and trying to keep your Tamagotchis alive, there really wasn't much time for us middle schoolers to earn those tiger tokens. But in the end, it didn't really, remember, didn't really matter as I never remember the store being open for business. And regardless of where you went to grade school, Hayes, Stevenson, Immaculate, or maybe further still, I would be willing to bet that we share many of the same memories, such as Dodgeball and Tag, King of the Mountain, and Warm Fuzzies. We can remember as if it were a dream when school was interrupted, not only for snack time, but for recess. How simple life was then, and how big the high schoolers seemed. Do you remember how excited we were when we heard the high schoolers coming to sing to us at Christmas time? 
And they finally came into our classroom. We just sat with our hands folded, pencils down, my, mouths wide open in awe. How quickly time flies. For the past couple of years, some of you have filled those godly shoes as chamber singers. And yet some things really haven't changed since elementary school. Many of the same people who brought peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in second grade continue to bring them this year. The same people who made us laugh in middle school by doing the bird made us laugh this year. The gifted children of third grade still boggle our minds. And maybe some of you joined us only this last year, and all you will remember are the Friday raffles with the school store guys and the names of the same four people who won every week. Regardless, these are the types of memories that I doubt will ever fade, though they are trivial, because they are the events and the people who have made our class truly unique. Yet I know there are still other memories that each of us have that are much more personal, and there are many lessons that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. Some of these lessons have been taught to us by our teachers. Wednesdays will forever be Woden's Day, and Mole Day will be celebrated faithfully every October 23rd. We have learned from Mrs. Feldman that if we do our homework and study hard, there will be no surprises. Some of us have perfected the skill of polite laughter thanks to Mr. Gunderson's jokes. And some of us have been fortunate enough to have learned from Mr. Zender how to step out of our comfort zone. And regardless if Mrs. Chizik taught you in inventive foods what the best vitamins are, we have learned from Mr. Freitager that only chalk can make our bones truly strong. <laughs> Personally, I know I will try hard to never waste my heartbeats. As Mr. Lewis taught me, they are very valuable. It would be impossible for me to sum up what has been, for some of us, the past 13 years of our lives together. But I doubt I would want to even if I could. I don't think I will remember in a year from now what I said today. I doubt some of you will. But that's okay. What's important is that we've made it. And what you will remember are the mixed emotions of excitement and fear, joy and sorrow that will overcome you when you cross the stage when your name is called for the very last time in alphabetical order. Thank you, Class of 2004, for the great memories. I'm going to raise this podium up as I introduce our next speaker. We have a new tall superintendent in Fridley who is uh, taking us in some real positive new directions. Please join me in welcoming Mark Robertson. I've never had one of these that I've liked. They've never been tall enough. So, Well, congratulations to the class of 2004. This is a bit of an awkward moment for me because um, we don't know each other very well, do we? I feel a little bit like I did last week when I um, spoke at the retirement get-together for the um, retirees from Fridley School District and um, most of them have been here for 35 years and I've been here for like 35 weeks and so I'm kind of the newcomer on the block but um, I wrote some comments down and I just I want to share a couple of things and usually when I talk um, I want you to know it comes from my heart and um, this is for the class of 2004 parents and community members you can listen but um, I want to talk to you just about two or three things tonight that I um, sort of life advice things as you as you move forward. You're getting lots of advice tonight, and um, boy, I thought when those speakers were up here, I wish I could talk like that when I was in high school. Um, I wish I could talk like that now, um, <laughs> but I'm working on it. Okay, um, this is a memorable night for all of you as you um, kind of close one phase of your life and move on to the next phase of your life. In some ways. Um, I'm sure that you have lots of uncertainty out there right now. And um, very few of you have your entire life mapped out. That's a good thing. If you do have it all mapped out, you probably need to come talk to me because it's probably not going to work out the way that you have planned right now. But as you graduate, I want you to think a little bit, not just about your own accomplishments and all the great things you should feel proud about, but you need to understand that um, you did not get here alone. There have been events, there have been people, there have been parents, there have been teachers, administrators, counselors, for some of you clergy. Many of them have contributed in some way um, in your getting here to this point tonight. So besides your own sense of pride and accomplishment tonight, I want you to just 
take the time and find the time after the ceremony to give your mom and dad a hug, give your friends a hug that help you through this thing, and, and your teachers and, and anybody else that you can uh, give a word of thanks to. I have two or three thoughts tonight. I want to talk about sprints and marathons, talk about snails and worms, and I want to talk about personal and professional re resumes. First of all, think about sprints and marathon. They are both races. They are very different. Some of you that have been in track and cross country and stuff know this. Um, you, you prepare for them differently. You run them differently. One lasts a long time. One you have to have lots of endurance for. One is over very, very quickly. Quite honestly, one of them has a real emphasis on winning. The other one has an emphasis on completing the race and completing it well. I would argue that a marathon, even though no, no offense to you sprinters in the, in the room, um, a marathon, in some ways, when I talk to marathoners, there's greater pride and sense of accomplishment because I think you have to pay a greater price psychologically and otherwise as you go through that race. Today, I would argue that you're completing a sprint. Doesn't feel like a sprint, feel like you've been in school forever, you're glad it's over at this point in time. But it wasn't that long ago when you took your first step, when you had your first birthday, when you walked into school for the first time, you learned your letters and numbers, learned to read, read your first book, all those kinds of things. From diapers to diploma, it really wasn't all that long a time. While you've experienced a lot and done a lot over the last 13 years of school, it's going to pale in comparison to the experiences that you're going to have over the next number of years of your life. The sprints you've just completed, I will say, only has, will prepare you in a small way for the marathon that you're about to begin. And I want you to stop thinking in terms of sprinting and think of in the terms of uh, running a marathon. Some of you thought you came to commencement tonight and that was an ending for you. Uh, I have news for you, the word commencement means beginning and you're just starting a new phase of life. If you think you're done with your learning, you're wrong. Uh, you're just beginning to learn. Uh, if you want to talk to your mom and dad, your grandpa and grandma, or anybody else here that's uh, over 30, they will tell you that life was very different 25, 30 years ago. And I would argue to you that um, you have no clue what life is going to be like 25 or 30 years from now. If you as a class and as individuals stay where you're at today, developmentally, educationally, et cetera, the world's going to pass you by. As you plan and contemplate your futures, you, think, you need to think more like the snail than the worm. And I'll just tell you a brief story. A worm and a snail started climbing a tree at the same time as an apple tree. The worm went quickly to the top and looked around, came back down very disappointed that he didn't find any apples to eat. On his way down, he ran into that snail. The snail was about two feet up the trunk. The worm said to the snail, you don't have to bother going up there because there aren't any apples up there to eat. And the snail in his thoughtful way said back, you know what, there will be by the time I get there. <laughs> you need to grasp the perspective of the snail. Learn to slow down a bit. You need to learn to think where the target's going to be rather than where the target is right now. If you aim where the target is right now, you're going to be way behind the target. Students, if you do not continue to learn, to grow, to retool throughout your entire life, you are not going to be equipped to face the world that you're going to have to face down the line. You might survive in the world, but you are not going to be successful or significant in this world. So life is a marathon. Prepare yourself for that. Think marathon. Act as if life were a marathon as you leave here tonight. If you do, you'll be better prepared and you're going to enjoy the journey along the way. Second thing, and maybe the most important thing that I want to talk to you about tonight is figure out what your life resume is going to be and what it is right now, actually. By a life metaphor, I do not mean what you're going to do someday. A lot of you are in the mode right now, I'm going to go to college, I'm going to go to the military, I'm going to go work. A lot of you are thinking, I'm going to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, a truck driver whatever it might be. That's not what I'm talking about. Those things are important. But more important than what you do is who you are. Your life metaphor is really what you are on the inside when all that other stuff gets torn away. Your accomplishments, your acquaintances, your titles, and all that kind of stuff. Anna Quinlan, she's a syndicated author. She wrote a book a few years back called A Short Guide to a Happy Life. A friend of mine gave it to me about a year ago when I was, had some 
fairly significant health issues. One of the things she did in the book was she said, I want to encourage you to write and figure out what your own resume is, your life metaphor. And she wasn't talking about a professional resume, but rather a life one, the bigger scheme of things uh, that we talk about in life. Too often we think of ourselves about what we do and what our identity is. It's associated with what we do rather than what we are. Many people develop their own sense of self-worth and identity from the accomplishments they've received, the awards they get, the jobs and the titles that they hold, that kind of stuff. Many also see themselves as um, who they are is by their friends and acquaintances, who they hang out with. They sort of have a pack mentality. We all have that. The problem with that is this. If our identity is too closely tied to what we do, to who we hang around with, the awards we get and all that kind of stuff, when that stuff all goes away, oftentimes we fall apart because that, that's our entire identity. Try not to make your identity too close to the job you do, the things you do, or the people you associate with. I'd encourage you to take time to think about and write down what your personal resume is and what you want it to be. One of the greatest tragedies of our life, I think, today in America today is that we do not reflect very often about where we're at and where we're headed and stuff. And so I want to give you an example of what I mean. I don't want you to sit and think about, you know, I'm going to be this doctor with three cars in the driveway and, you know, snowmobiles and whatever else you value in life and stuff. I want you to think about the inner type of qualities that you want to develop in your life. I'll give you what I think my life metaphor is, good, bad, or otherwise. And these are the things that really matter to me. I'm a good father to my four boys. I try not to let my job get in the way of being a good parent. In fact, when I was uh, at Forest Lake High School as principal my first year, I skipped graduation because my oldest son was graduating. I wasn't going to miss that. I'm a good friend and companion to my wife, and I work every day to try to make my marriage vows meaningful. I don't consider myself the center of the universe, and I never will. I know that I'm not the smartest person in this room, but I'm not at the other end either. I'm somewhere in the middle, probably. I understand and I've figured out in my life that I need to take care of my body, I need to take care of my mind, and I need to take care of my soul, too. I care for people that are less fortunate than I am, and I believe strongly that we all have gifts, and those gifts are to share with other people, not just to keep to ourselves. I understand that I have competitive qualities. I also have cooperative qualities. I have little desire in life just to survive. I want to be beyond successful. I want to have some significance in the things that I do. I work hard, but I also play. I know how to laugh, and I know how to have fun. I show up. I get in the game. I try to do my best. And even though sometimes I know I'm not always the best at what I'm trying to do, dancing would be one of those things. Um, I have a wedding coming up in three weeks, and I'm kind of fearing that one, but um, we'll work on it. I listen, I'm a positive influence on others, and I have integrity. I would ask you as a class of 2004 to figure out who you are, what is your personal metaphor, what is your life metaphor going to be, and do it periodically as you go through life. It's going to make more difference if you do that than if you continually worry about what job you're going to have. Those things are important too, though. Finally, I'd like you to learn that it all isn't all about yourselves and your wants and your needs. It's about other people, too. We live in an era today where we're taught to take care of ourselves first. That's the American way of life. And then whatever happens and we have left over for others, we pass on. I ask you to consider those around you first and give yourself to others and, what, and give what you have to others. I read last week um, in an article, three billion people, three billion people, unfathomable number, are living on this planet and they live on less than $2 a day. Most of us put that in vending machines in a given day. Two bucks a day for three million people on this planet. Half the people, one and a half billion people, have no health care in any way, shape, or form. One billion don't have clean water to drink. And nearly as many are chronically malnourished and hungry as you go to bed every night. We as Americans live in a world where many, we have many times the resources of anybody around the world. We have far, far greater opportunities, and I would ask that you think about that and not squander those opportunities, but also when you get those things, to share those with other people. Um, I know that 
you don't have to look very far in our neighborhoods either to find someone that needs help and need, and, and that if you have something to give, then you ought to be giving that to somebody else. Sometimes we think the needs around us are so large that we can't have any impact, and we think that we're just one small drop in a big bucket. And I would just say that you're looking at the problem from the wrong uh, perspective. If you have just one drop to give, think of the problem as a little tiny bucket and put your drop in it and it'll fill that little bucket up. Take the drop that you can give and each little bucket will be filled overflowing quite easily. If you approach that way, the question changes to how many buckets can I fill? Be a person of service. Class of 2004, feel great about where you're sitting today. Uh, you deserve to be congratulated, but please be aware this isn't the finish line. You're at the beginning of a long marathon. Think, act, and prepare for yourself as you're in a marathon rather than a sprint. Figure out who you are. And if you have to, do that when you're all alone, when no one's looking. Um, live your lives with a sense of awe, appreciation, gratitude, and give what you have and, and what you are to those that are around you and you're fortunate to encounter in life. Don't focus on the destination only. Enjoy the journey along the way. I'm sure that you as a class will demonstrate great things as you go through life. Come back to Fridley and give something back to the place that you started. Congratulations and good luck. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker. And our next speaker, um, I'm, I'm not sure why I'm introducing him to you, because you selected him. And it's a great honor here in tradition in Fridley to select a teacher to speak at commencement exercises. And this year, you chose Kirk Myra. He is a teacher and a coach in the building, and obviously esteemed to be selected by the class of 2004. Please welcome Kirk to the podium. Members of the graduating class of 2004 and your distinguished guests, I want to thank you for asking me to speak tonight. Um, I don't know if a lot of you realize this, but you're a very special class to me. Um, 23 years ago, almost to this day, I sat in your very seats in a similar program to this. And as Livy had talked about some of the memories, I went through many of the same experiences you guys did. Um, in fact, I had many of the teachers that you guys had. Um, and I'm going to list them here. Mr. Liu, Mr. Zender, Ms. Bilar, um, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Kratz, Ms. Rintela, Madam Ferry, Mr. Bergman, or Bergstrom, excuse me, Mr. Bergstrom. Um, I had all you in class, and if I failed to thank you back when I graduated, I'd like to thank you now for everything you did for me and that you've done for these guys. <laughs> but you guys, I know you very well. When you guys came over here from the middle school, I came with you. I was with you for four years in the middle school. Some of you were in my homeroom. I saw you guys as fifth graders who couldn't open a lock. When you were eighth graders, I had half of you guys in my American history class for an entire year, and I ate lunch with you every day. You came over here. Um, I've had many of you in numerous classes. I've had most of you in one single class. I've dined with half of you every day for the last four years. Um, and as I said, I've had the privilege of knowing this class like no other class that I, I've ever known or that I ever will because I've spent more time with you. Um, and now I get to see you off as you're entering the real world. Um, it's important to look back and remember where you came from because all of your experiences in Fridley have helped shape you. But tonight, it's not about looking back, it's about looking forward. And in trying to find out what I was going to speak to you about tonight, I decided to ask some of your fellow teachers, um, or some of my fellow teachers, what would be a good topic. And I asked Mr. Liu, because two years ago, Mr. Liu was up here speaking before the graduating class. And I had Mr. Liu as a teacher. I had him as a tennis coach. He meant a lot to me. He helped change my life. And today, I think of him as a mentor. And I said to Mr. Liu, I said, Mr. Liu, what's your advice? And he said to me, he says, oh, he says, Kirk, this is the most important speech you're ever going to give. You're going to be so nervous, you can hardly speak. So I'm waiting for his deep advice, and he says, don't screw it up. <laughs> and 
And I kind of looked at him and he says, don't screw it up because this sucker is going to be on cable TV three times a day for the next two months. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Liu. I do appreciate that advice. So I asked Mr. Reichel, who I'd never had Mr. Reichel as a teacher. Um, those of you who see me right on the blackboard understand my artistic abilities and understand why I never took any art classes. But Mr. Reichel said, you need to do something really different, something unique, something that the kids will remember the rest of their lives. Uh, Jack, I I'm sorry, I couldn't do that. And I was going to ask Mr. Zender for his advice, but I had Mr. Zender in, as a 10th grade speech teacher. And I remember a lot of things from giving a speech, but I remember him telling me that if you're ever speaking in front of a large crowd and you're really nervous, that if you imagine that everyone is out in the audience is sitting in their underwear, you're going to be much, much more relaxed. Well, Mr. Liu and Mr. Zender were partially correct. I'm very nervous and I can speak. And the fact that you guys are all sitting out there in your underwear it hasn't made me much less nervous. So I asked some of you guys, I said, what do you guys want to hear me talk about? And I asked a number of you, and you all said kind of some response. We want to know what you learned after high school. And they said, not the book stuff, not the book stuff, what, what you learned about life. And then every time somebody said that, somebody in the back room would say, yeah, we really like it when old people tell stories. <laughs> um, but I decided that's what I talk about, and I talked about some of this stuff with the NHS members earlier in the year. Um, after I graduated from Fridley, um, I understood that things are going to be different and things are going to be really different for you guys. From now on, you guys are going to be responsible for yourselves. Your parents aren't going to be there every second of the day helping you. You're going to take on the load. Um, you'll be making decisions that will affect you for the rest of your lives. Now, getting back to what you guys want to hear, the, the most important thing that I've learned since I graduated from Fridley here is that I've learned to be happy, that I've learned that I can have it all. And there's a number of things you have to do to have it all, and I'm going to share you with that. You, you're not going to do it the same way I did. Not every one of you can come back here and be a teacher. I'm sorry, we don't have that many teachers here. But what you can do, um, is realize that you can have it all. If you talk to all the successful people in the world, they'll tell you that you can have it all, and they're living proof of it. If you talk to someone who's not happy and doesn't have it all, and they tell you that it's impossible to have it all, they don't because they never tried, because they didn't realize they could do it. The second thing you have to do is you have to have a clear definition of what having it all is. And nobody can define that, define that for you except yourselves. And lastly, and this is the part that maybe age has taught me, is that as you go through life, you're going to change your definition of what having it all means. Um, in junior high, I remember that I thought if I had a stereo in my room, if I had the new skateboard, if I had the new Adidas, if I made the traveling basketball team, I would have it all. And I met some of those goals and I had it all, and then the next year, guess what? It wasn't enough. I wanted more. When I was in the ninth grade, which was still across the street at the junior high, um, part of having it all to me meant doing well in art class. Believe it or not, at one time I really enjoyed art. And we had this assignment. We were going to do a big color drawing of an animal in chalk. And we had three weeks to do it. And I poured my heart and soul into it. And I even came in after school to work on it. And in three weeks, I finished it. Man, I was so proud of my drawing of a poodle. It was awesome. So I brought it home. And I took my masterpiece out, and I showed it to my mom. And my mom, bless her heart, told me how wonderful it was. But just then, I had a twin sister who also had art. She was in the same class. She was in a different class. And she did the same project. And she came home, and she unrolled her project. And here was a beautiful bald eagle. In so much detail, you could see the individual feathers on the bird. And I realized at that time that I have no artistic ability whatsoever. 
And what was obvious to everybody else wasn't totally obvious to me. And the importance of that is if you're going to have it all and you're going to define what having it all is to you, you need to do it within your abilities, your talents, and your desires. You must do that if you want to have it all. Um, when I went to college, I changed my definition of having it all again. Uh, it meant having a car. You had to have a car in college to have it all. It meant getting, getting good grades so that I could get a job. Why did I want a good job? So I could make money, buy a house, buy a nicer car, I could buy more stuff. We used to call it the American dream. And I believe it's still here and I believe a lot of you have it. And when I went to college, I thought about becoming a teacher. Um, it always kind of interested me. But for some reason, it didn't fit in with my definition of having it all. Even back in the 80s, teachers didn't make a lot of money. And I knew if I did that, I could never meet my own definition of having it all. So I went to grad school. I got a good job. I made some money. I started acquiring things that were on my list for having it all. And one day I was driving to work. And I shouldn't say in one day. It's happened over a period of time. But one day I was driving to work in a new car, and I realized that you know, this new car doesn't function that much differently than the old one I used to drive in college. And about 11 years ago, I changed my definition of having it all again, and I started teaching. Now, there are a lot of reasons why I became a teacher, and they aren't really important. I could spend a lot of time talking about them. But what's important is the fact that you guys understand that you can change your definition of having it all. I realized that becoming teaching that I was going to have to cross off some of those things on my list. And guess what? It didn't really matter. Okay. I'm not going to lie to you, having a house, a car, all that stuff is important to a point, but you cannot define having it all on materialistic items and things that you want. Oftentimes they're too hard to attain and oftentimes they're too easy to lose. Um, although my definition of having it all has been changed over life, as I think back to my years since Fridley, and there haven't been too many times in my life when I don't think I've had it all. And there's a number of reasons for that. And I'm going to tell you what those reasons are. And I think if you can do this, it will help you guys have it all also. The first thing you have to do is you have to be at peace with yourself. You've got to be comfortable that you are doing the best that you can with the hand that life has dealt you. You have to accept that and do your best. Secondly, you have to be happy and secure in the relationships with those closest to you. Your parents, your siblings, your significant other days, or your significant others, eventually your spouses and children. Because that's what's important. If you think back to your memories in high school, you can think of events and stuff, but the important part is the people you shared them with. That's not going to change throughout your life. Events will be exciting and stuff, but it's the people who are with you who will make them. And lastly, you have to be constantly growing and improving. You always have to push yourself just a little bit. You can't stagnate. Um, I believe if you guys can do those things, then you'll be very happy and you will be able to have, have it all. I want to congratulate all of you on your graduation and wish you the very best in all your future successes. And a few years ago, I started telling all of you that you left my class to have a nice life. Tonight, I'm not going to tell you to have a nice life. I want you guys to go out and have a great life. So thank you very much. In order to uh, pull a program like this together, you really need uh, the whole school pulling together. We have uh, outstanding secretaries at our school. We have uh, one in particular that coordinates our entire graduation commencement ceremony, and that's Sue Culbertson. I just want to thank Sue, and I think it deserves, she deserves a big round of applause this evening. Our custodial crew gets little recognition, but they've been working down here for days, setting the stage, vacuuming, dusting. Uh, they're an incredible group, and uh, they're led by Rick Moss and Greg Kintop. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, 
as, my, as the first year uh, principal here at Fridley, I had a chance to view last year's commencement tape, the videotape that's uh, being broadcast actually right now and being uh, set to go for next year. We, uh, we actually sell copies of the tape for $5, and I just, after watching last year's tape, want to encourage you to get a copy of it. You can bring in a, your own copy of a tape and bring that into our media center. And this is an outstanding production. It's led by Mr. Dave Harvett, Judy Armold, and the entire media staff. Please give them a huge round of applause. I also need to thank our admin team, Steve Emerson and Renee Van Gorp, for their unending support for all the good things that are happening in our school. In the right-hand corner of our uh, gymnasium tonight, we have uh, an, a teachers from around the school district. I'd like you to please rise to be recognized this evening. I would also like to recognize four Fridley High School teachers that will be retiring at the end of this school year. Some of them are on duty and are scattered around the gymnasium tonight. But would Mr. Bergstrom, Wayne Kratz, Dave Nelson, and Gary Zender please stand to be recognized. At this point, I would like to recognize our many honor students. I would like to begin by recognizing our co-valedictorians. This year, we have three students that have maintained a perfect 4.0 GPA during their four years at Fridley High School. Would Anna Johnson, Alyssa McKenzie, and Lene Olson please stand to be recognized? Congratulations. And now would all students with a 3.0 to a 3.49 graduating with high honors, please, uh, with honors I should say, please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Next, would all students graduating with a 3.5 to a 3.749, graduating now with high honors, please stand to be recognized. Congratulations. And finally, would all students with a 3.75 to a 4.0 GPA, graduating with highest honors, please stand to be recognized. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for, would the members of the class of 2004 please rise. <laughs> members of the Board of Education and Superintendent Robertson, the members of this class have fulfilled all the requirements for graduation from this school as set forth by the State Board of Education and the Board of Education of Fridley School District 14. In recognition of this achievement, they are entitled to their diplomas as graduates of Fridley High School. We seek the cooperation of all guests this evening by withholding your applause and cheers until the entire class has been presented. Chairman Kim Sampson, at this time, the class of 2004 will be called to the platform to receive their diplomas. Row one, you may begin to make your way to the stage. The rest of you may be seated.
Kareem Adoraman. Andrew Adler. Ryan Allenson. Matthew Allard. Rachel Allen. Ryan Allen. Brandon Anderson. Jared Anderson. Christopher Amak. Stanford Avorklia. Alicia Bargut. Brittany Berrigan. James Bartz. Courtney Benjamin. Shauna Benick. Miles Bickford. Nat Bunjun Wetwat. Kara Brandt. Alva Brupla. Crystal Brutlog. Catherine Buchan. Daniel Bullock. Leon Burnett. Kyle Burnham. Jathan Calejo. Serene Callison. Al Hussein Kamara. Veronica Campos. Ryan Carlson. May Chow. Rick Seelock. Tara Conley. Ryan Dale. Seth Delorme. Vernas Demirovic. Nicholas Sturtinger. Tanya Diaz. Natasha Diggs. Mercy Dolo. Corey Donnelly. Tanya Duenow. Paige Eggert. Mayan Eka. Carolyn Fagnan. Jenny Fitzgerald. Jamila Flomer. Nelson Foley. Deontay Freeman. Jason Frost. Ashley Quinn Galligan. Caitlin Gaynor. Casey Gertz. Kent Glyden. Amanda Gustafson. Angela Gustafson. Daniel Halverson. Marianne Harris. Wayne Hendricks, Amanda Hobbs, Catherine Hogan, Rita Hockstead, 
Ryan Hollihan, Sarah Holmes, Jason Holtzleiter, John Holum, Elma Hugic, Paul Hussein, Tu Hun, Daniel Jackman, Stephen Jacobson, Shami Javid, Anna Johnson, Brandon Johnson, Alicia Johnson, Kristen Johnson, Mark Johnson, Olivia Johnson, Abu Bakar Kanyari, Farrakhan Kanyari, Joseph Kapala, Abdul Karjul, Crystal Castle, Kelsey Kaysen, Jonathan Kadrowski, Corey Keltzenberg, Christopher Kent, Shayla King, Mallory Kitzman, Laura Knowles, Emmanuel Colley, Michael Colley, Barbara Kanwinski, Wendell Corkpore, Corey Kravick, Kimberly Crumlauf, Brianne Quatera, Danielle Larson. Christopher Lemke, Corey Lindahl, Joshua Locker, Deanne Lewis, Patrick Lewitley, Alyssa McKenzie, Joseph Madsen, Daniel Maldonado, Andrew Marsh, Jacob Mason, Leah Massey, Katie Mistel, Andrea Mathi. Antoine McAllister, Joshua McCara, Christopher Melgard, Ryan Melly, Marilyn Mills, Michael Milner. Kathy Miranda, Michael Monding, Nicholas Montague, Nicholas Moore, 
Tabitha Moore. Catherine Morrissey. Daniel Nalepka. Sarah Nebelum. Lisa Neiman. Michael Nolan. Tara Nordgren. Rob Nordstrom. Timothy Oliver. Lene Olson. Vijay Umro. Laura Paolo. Leah Paquin. Daniel Parton. Channing Pennington. Rebecca Perez. Emily Peterson. Andrew Pat Patasic. Amber Prieto. Michael Quinn. Elizabeth Radio. Jeffrey Regan Jr. Nicholas Rivard. Joseph Roy. Matthew Roki. Jessica Rossing. Andrew Wrighty. Emily Sandberg. Joshua Schmidt. Sherilyn Schramm. David Shelton. Michael Seeloff. Adam Simon. Nicholas Sitz. Jason Sparks. Dexter Spillman. Matthew Standle. Blake Stevens. Tenzin Sweetsang. Tu Tao. Lisa Thomas. Olivia Trasic. Farudin Turnajic. Joshua Tyra. Sheng Vang. Zoa Vang. Matthew Vopat. Nicole Wagner. Sarah Wallace. Garrett Werner. James Westover. Matthew Whalen. Michelle White. Stephen Witt. Sluer Zili. John, John Zerwas. Andrew Zwak. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the class of 2004.
lot of hands to shake. I did it last year. It seems like it goes on forever. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll cut mine down. Oh, you know, I tell you, it's just, uh, we're all new to this stuff, so I think it's... Well, so I said, I said, I guess an hour and a half, and then I backed off tomorrow. It turned out to be an hour and a half.